Uh, today I'm talking about Koda and Kākahi uh, monitoring and Lake Wadidi, mainly for the um, Oho Channel Diversion Board. Uh, it's a joint effort between myself, uh, Joe Butterworth, who's actually on his stag do tonight, so he's probably in no condition to talk uh, this evening, and also uh, Komatua Willie Emery. So, um, the coda or the freshwater crayfish, and the kākahi, or freshwater mussel, uh, ecologically important species in the Te Arawa Lakes. Uh, they are considered ecosystem engineers, and what that means is they alter or modify habitat, which influences the abundance and distribution of other flora and fauna. Um, they're considered to be threatened and in decline through um, a lot of New Zealand waterways. Uh, they're quite abundant still in the Te Arawa Lakes, as we'll see uh, later. Uh, freshwater mussels are in decline pretty much uh, throughout the world. Uh, they are extremely uh, significant to, to iwi and, and considered tangless species. Uh, the coda uh, in pre-European times was used to barter and trade with iwi from outlying districts and uh, today uh, they are still a significant species and they are harvested uh, from out through the lakes. Uh, the kākahi on the other hand are uh, still very abundant in a lot of our lakes but I don't think anyone would consider them to be uh, uh, particularly tasty, and uh, if you try one of those, you'll know why. So the Oho Channel Diversion Wall, uh, basically what it does is it takes oops, nutrient rich water from Lake Rotorua, comes down here through the wall and down into the Ōkiri Arm, so it prevents it from going in to Lake Wadidi where it can cause uh, uh, water quality issues. Uh, at the time of the resource consent, Here are hot pools. So this one here is inside the wall, these other two are our controls. So we started seasonal sampling in 2005 in the Orkiri Arm, um, and we're using the Tokora method that Andy uh, alluded to before. And about in 2004, I was contracted by Niwa and the Tiara Lakes Trust to um, come up with the best method for monitoring coda in the Te Arawa Lakes because uh, crayfish are quite hard to monitor in lakes. Um, you can use a lot of different methods, western methods such as scuba diving and underwater cameras. Those methods have got a lot of disadvantages. You can't really see in a lot of our lakes at certain times when there's algae blooms or the sediments stirred up. Uh, using little traps, we trialled a lot of these little traps and, and nets and basically what happened there where they, we found they were very size selective, so you only get medium and large size uh, cora. You don't get the very small ones. Uh, so we wanted a method that would sample all size ranges. So we started working with oh, damn. Uh, Willie Emery uh, over here, and he showed us how to use a, a tow cora, which is a traditional Te Arawa Tuwhari Tō method of harvesting coda in the Te Arawa Lakes. Um, in the old days, they used to have ah, sorry, yeah. this. Um, it was a floating contraption, really, with the fern bundles on the on the lake bed. And um, but these days, we use a sunken one with a, a line on the lake bed with the fern bundles just just off there. And basically, how it works is the cora go into these fern bundles and they um, use them as habitat as a place to live and we come along, we pick them up and disturb them and we go along and we um, 
count the measure and, and monitor them. So this is uh, some of the emery whānau making these fern bundles. It's just the common bracken fern that you see growing along the, the lakeside, uh, the roadsides and stuff. We basically use 10 to 12 fronds uh, per bundle. And this is just a photo caption of the, the fern bundles getting pulled into the, into the boat. And we use a, a, a big sort of a scoop net underneath called a core upper. And it's, as the, it's, this photo here shows a little cobra stuck in the fern there, but as the fern comes to the air surface, the uh, cobras uh, fall out, so we collect them in this uh, core upper where we go ahead and we uh, count them, we measure them, uh, we determine uh, the sex, and we um, assess whether they're in soft shell, egg bearing, or if they're carrying diseases. Uh, just a quick little lesson here, I've got a bit of time, so this is how you measure coda, basically from the, the back of the eye to the end of the carapace there, and that's called the uh, OCL, or orbit carapace length, and uh, the harvestable size in the lakes is about 28 mils OCL, which is probably about, you know, about that big. And that takes a coda about three to four years in the Te Arawa lakes to reach that size. And the first maturity for the females when they first come to, to having eggs on them is about 21 mils OCL in the lakes, and that takes about one and a half to two years to get to that stage. So what have we found so far in our monitoring? So at the start there, we had quite good numbers of, of coda, and um, I'll just go through this graph a bit more. So here's mean abundance per bundle. So we have about 10 bundles on each toe, right? So we're getting about you know, 50, around here, about 20 to 50 coda per bundle. We've got 10 of them out there, so that's 200 to 500 coda. Um, so the light bars are the orkiri arm toe, the medium shaded bars is the tiako, and the dark one is the hot pulse. Right. And the arrow just indicates when the uh, Oho Channel War went in, which was about uh, July 2008, when it became fully operational. So we got a sort of a bit of a decline at the start there, and then everything sort of just levelled off uh, ever since, so there's no significant change since about 2008. So um, what are the reasons for this decline? Well, no one's really quite sure. Um, but productivity in Lake Lord Edie is getting cleaner, you know, clear, cleaner and clearer. Uh, the TLI, or the Trophic Level Index, which is an index of productivity, lake productivity, has reduced from about 4.4 in 2004 down to 3.4 in 2014. Um, and overseas studies have shown that cora, uh, crayfish in productive lakes generally have higher, higher abundances, higher growth rates, and uh, higher fecundities. So the lake's getting clearer, so maybe the cora numbers are just, there's just not the food for them there anymore. Uh, the water cl clarity's increased from 4.6 to uh, 7.3 metres, so it's a great improvement. Um, and this is, this is really great if you go out there and look at the, the, the lake and the, look at the water clarity, and et cetera, but what it does do is there's more light now going through the water column and the aquatic macrophytes, particularly hornwort, which is the predominant um, species in the lake, is really taken off. And this not only affects our, um, our traps, our, our fern bundles, but a study in Norway has shown that uh, in a lake that was invaded by a Canadian pondweed or Elodea, um, there was a 50% decrease in crayfish abundance in that lake. So weed has a, a big effect and it's, and it's probably having um, in, increasingly important. So it's just some other results. Um, Cobra size. Uh, the biggest cobra we've got are off Tiako, the mean size of about 29 mils OCL. Uh, the hot pools are, are, are big as well, but in the Orkiri Arm, a lot of small cobra. The, the mean depth in the Orkiri Arm is four metres, and female cobra go and release their juveniles into these shallow, productive, weedy areas, 
and that's why we get a lot of small cobra in there. Uh, the female to male ratio is probably is, it's about one to one, so there's not much difference there. And as far as molting goes, um, there's no definite season for molting like crayfish have in the sea. They're molting right continuously throughout the year. And sort of any time you'll catch between about 5 and 12% and of your catch will be soft-shelled cobra. And this has got a lot of implications when you're uh, designing regulations, for the, uh, particularly for the lakes trust. Uh, that's the, the biggest one we've caught so far in our monitoring. I should um, state that everything we catch goes back into the, into the lake after. Willie's laughing because uh, sometimes he gets tempted. But <laughs> So this one had a, a, a length of 53 uh, millimetres OCL, an estimated weight of about 140 grams, and that's an ice cream container there, so it's taken up pretty much that whole container. And it's probably about 15 years old or even, even older. Uh, I'll just run through this graph as well. We've got the percentage of uh, egg-bearing females on the y-axis here and the month of the year. And uh, what this shows us is there's not much happening, not many, not much, not many females with eggs between about uh, December to April. And then after that, uh, you know, most of the females you're going to catch in your tow are going to be uh, with egg. And that's also uh, important when you're designing uh, regulations, harvesting regulations. So in, in summary, uh, cobra is still very abundant in the Orkiriyama and Lake Rauditi. Uh, there's been a decline in abundance, and it's possibly due to um, reduced productivity and increased uh, weed growth. Uh, we're also looking at kākahi, and that's a picture of Joe Butterworth there. Um, we've, we use a shallow water method to, to um, count the kākahi, to monitor the kākahi. Basically, it's, uh, we use a 40 metre by half a metre transect. Uh, the water depth, we go up to about 1.2 metres. We use this underwater viewer and a measuring stick on this side, and that gives us we not only count kākahi, but um, we also record the water depth, um, the sediment depth, um, the type of sediment, and also the aquatic plant growth on the bottom. Uh, once again, seasonal sampling since 2005, and we've got five monitoring sites. And these monitoring sites are here in black. So we've got three inside the wall. One, two, three, and then two outside the wall. So we've got one here at Orkawa Bay and one at Ruatua. We did have one at Tumuana Point, but we had such low counts of kaki that we discontinued that site a couple of years ago. And this is what's happening with kaki abundance. Uh, we've got the mean number of kaki per square metre on the y-axis, and we've got uh, three sites here, the boat ramp, the rest area and the ditch. Those are the uh, one to three inside the wall and these two are outside the wall. Um, the light bars represent those counts before the wall uh, was completed, and the shaded bars uh, since completion, and it's this year's, the pattern bar is this year's sampling. So basically not much is happening in most of these sites. They're all pretty, there's no significant increases or declines, although it has been, appears to be a, a gradual increase in abundance generally, uh, there's been a, quite a big decline at one site within the wall. And um, so why is this? Um, well, there's been a lot of fine silt build up in sections of the, the shoreline here since the wall went in, and this is mainly because we don't get the easterly wave action that we used to get um, before the wall was, was in there, so the sediments builds up in there. But there's also the um, current coming down through the Oho Channel, which acts like a, um, like a stream or a river, and you get areas of accretion and erosion. And where you get a lot of that fine silt uh, deposited, you, um, it's not so suitable for kākahi, and that ditch site is in one of those um, accretion sites. 
Uh, but the last few years, uh, things are changing in there. Uh, that, a lot of that fine salt has been colonised by low-growing plant species, so it's consolidated the sediment, which has made it more suitable for kākahi. And now uh, one of our biggest issues with our counts at some of these sites is the amount of algal growth on the bottom and trying to, um, to spot the kākahi amongst the growth. Uh, I should also mention that we've, um, we use uh, a lot of iwi workers and uh, at Kaitiaki and Kaimahi, there's Joe Set Morn, uh, Joe Tahana there as part of the project. So in conclusion, uh, kaura and kaki are still abundant in the Okariyama Lake Rauriri six years after the completion of the, of the wall. However, the habitat condi conditions for both species is constantly changing as water quality improves um, in both in Lake Rotiti and Lake Rotorua, because that Lake Rotorua water ends up down at the Okiri Arm. Uh, I've got a bit of time, so I'll just show another couple of graphs. Okay, this one here shows cora abundance in the Tiarua Lakes as part of my PhD study. So we've got catch per unit effort on this uh, axis, the y axis. That's the number per turn bundle the mean number, and then we've got the lakes across uh, this x-axis, and those are ordered in terms of uh, increasing nutrient enrichment. So Rotoma, very clear lake, and we've got reasonably high numbers of coda in that lake. Uh, Tarawera or Karaka, uh, quite low numbers of, of coda, particularly out deep. Uh, Roriri um, is a really good numbers of coda as well. And Rotakaki, Rotehu, um, moderate numbers. And then here's the Orkiri Arm, lots of small kaura there. And then we've got Lake Rotorua. Um, we sampled out by Makoya Island, and it's just full of kaura out there. It's unbelievable. But then you get to Lake Okaro, which is a, a super enriched, uh, super eutrophic lake. And kaura are now extinct in that lake. In the 1960s, there's references where there were lots of big coda in Lake Okaro. Um, what's happened there is for a lot of the year, there's just no oxygen in the bottom waters, and coura need at least five parts per million um, of ox dissolved oxygen to, to survive. Once it gets lower than that, they start moving out. Uh, if we just look at size, uh, this is the mean size on this axis. And what it's showing us is, here's Lake Rodidi here, some of the, hop, the biggest coda, mean size of coda in the, all of the lakes. But these are generally the clear lakes, the um, oligotrophic lakes. And once you get to here, you get to more eutrophic lakes or nutrient-rich lakes. And um, basically the size is a lot smaller. There's usually a lot more coda in those productive lakes, but they're of smaller size. And um, so just uh, some acknowledgements there, first of all to Andy and, and Gloria for, for, for your help at the Regional Council, uh, the Tiara Lakes Trust, um, Roku, I saw them come in, yeah, kia ora Roku, uh, before, our Kaitiaki and Kaimahi, uh, particularly Trevor Huduwai and Chris Taipiti, uh, Joe Tahana, Joe Setmore, uh, Niwa, John Quinn and Chris Hickey, and also Frist and MSI for funding um, a lot of my PhD work. Uh, 